Well, I want to say welcome again to all of our visitors and to all of us this morning. It's good that we're here to worship God. For many, this is a holiday, uh, and a lot of times, many people with holidays like to take time off from worshiping the Lord, and that's not that's not the right attitude to have. We're going to talk about that a little bit in our lesson this morning, and kind of an aside. But I'm glad that each one of us are here and understand that whatever the holiday might be, uh, we need to remember that there is a holiday for a Christian, and that is to remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The sacrifice that he made and coming together on the first day of the week to worship is what we should be doing, showing our great gratitude towards God. Let's see if this is going to work, and I hope so. Uh, I'm not the best at uh, with PowerPoints and my speaking, so hopefully I'll remember to push the button when we when I need to. But we're going to go ahead and get into our lesson this morning. And in our lesson, um, I want to think about a little bit what today is, for just a second, as a means of illustrating what we're going to be studying from the Bible. Today, of course, is July 4th, and I don't know how many, 200 some years ago, uh, close to 250 now, I think we're getting... Uh, to, to it, that our country declared its independence from England. And when that happened, I don't know if the founding fathers really thought about what they were doing completely, all the ramifications of it, but one of the things they were saying when they were wanting to disentangle us from, from the King of England and the rule of law over in England was that we're creating a new nation. And as a new nation, we needed to be a new people. I saw something on Facebook, and this was actually before I really thought about what I was going to be speaking on today, a couple of weeks ago. It was kind of an interesting article. And it, it kind of looked at the fact that between 1620 and the mid-1750s, there were four major influxes of people from England into the colonies into what became the United States. And they were four distinct reasons why that group of people came over here. Of course, I, I wish I had saved it and could have gone through all of it. It really isn't all that important, more interesting to me because I like history. I think we know one of them. The first one was, it was religious. There were a lot of people that came over, the pilgrims and others. They were the first group that came over in the, in the early part of the 1600s, and it was for religious freedom, they were fleeing religious persecution. I remember one other, and it kind of affects us in Virginia, because they said these folks came uh, from, uh, I think this was maybe the Cornwall area, the southwestern part of, of England. They, these, these four migrations came from different parts of the country in England and different reasons. These were the folks that lost the, the English Civil War, and so they left. And when they came over here, they were, to a great extent, aristocrats in England. And when they came here, they became America's aristocracy. They were the planters. They were the ones that, that the that brought, came in and had the plantations. They started here to a, move to a great extent here into the mid-Atlantic, and then they moved down into the south. And there were two others. But the point was that each one of those migrations had a... It was, a, it was a different group of people, and they came here with a different view of what they were coming here for and what they were going to do when they came here. Well, the Founding Fathers now had a, a problem of not only disentangling ourselves from England, getting us to think as Americans, but each one of these groups came here with a different view, and so they were going to have to try to unify all of this, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. But not only did we have... Of course, at, at that time, the majority of people living in the colonies, they were from England. There were others. There were smaller groups of people from other European countries that were enslaved Africans. All of these had to become, over time, to be viewed as Americans. And even though with enslaved Africans, they, at that point, they just didn't care about that. That became a, an issue later on, as we'll, as we'll see. But the point is that Founding fathers needed to try to get us to start thinking as Americans and not having an extension to England because we're fighting England. We're trying to separate from England. We need to now start thinking of ourselves as Americans. In on August 21st, 1776, Ben Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson made uh, some sort of a, a, a 
motion in whatever body exists at that time, the Revolutionary Council, whatever it was, uh, to make the phrase in pluribus unum, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, a motto. It was going to be a motto for the great seal of the United States, and they also wanted that to be a motto for America. Well, it'd be like a national motto. Well, they got half of their half of that their, their job right. They got that on the seal. And if you look at your coins, most of the coins and even some of our dollar bills, you can see that phrase, e pluribus unum, on our on the coinage. It means out of many, one. They didn't make it into a motto, it became the unofficial motto of the United States, but in 1956 Congress passed a, a law or a, something that basically made in God we trust as the national motto, and that's why you see that on our coinage as well. But it's easy to say we need to be unified, but it's it's difficult to do so. It's easy to, to create a, a motto and put it down, whether it's in Latin or English or any other language, but it's a lot harder to put that into practice. And that's, that's we see that in our country. It's been a work in progress for 200 and some years for as long as we've been Americans, because there's always people dying, there's always people being born, there's always people coming in from other places, and everybody's got a different idea and opinion, and we have to somehow try to be unified. So over time, that's been a work in progress. It's something that's, that we as Americans have to try to be doing. For us as Christians, that's something that's important as well. And that's going to be what we're going to be looking at this morning, the idea of unity. How do we as a body of people be unified. Because in AD 30, when the church was first established, Jesus realized that if we're going to be bringing a lot of people together with different backgrounds and cultures and languages, there has to be a way of unifying us. And what we see in this passage here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, and, and this is the only passage we're going to be looking at that's out of the English Standard Version. I like this how it was actually translated, because it says that we are a chosen race. If you look in the King James or the New King James that I read from, it says there you're a chosen generation. We're a chosen race. Generation kind of makes us think about, well, today. And, and we might think about when we read this, well, this was written to people back in the first century, so it's, well, they were the first generation of Christians, so you were chosen. Well, that's not really what this means. This is for all of us. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people for God's own possession. And as we go on down to the end of verse 10, it says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. We are the people of God. And if we're going to truly be the people of God, then we have to have a way of being unified to live and act as the people of God. This has been God's plan from the beginning. It actually goes back to the Old Testament. Even though God carved out a small group of people, the, the Jews, and used them to bring the Savior to the world and salvation to all of us, it was never God's plan to just work with the Jews and to ignore the Gentiles. It was always God's plan that the whole world would have an opportunity to be saved. And we see this in Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. Where, where the prophet says, Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, You are my people, and they shall say, You are my God. Now, who are these people here? Well, if we, as we move on into the New Testament and we move to the time of the church, it wasn't very long after the church was established that the growing pains and this issue of unity reared his head. In chapter 5 of the book of Acts, we already see that there is a problem between Jewish widows and Gentile widows, uh, and, and or the Hebrew widows and, and the, uh, 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 the Jew, I'm sorry, Jew and Gentile, in terms of their, of their being treated in terms of the daily ministration. And that all goes back to their backgrounds, Jew and Gentile. And later on, 10, 10 chapters later, in Acts 15, we have to have a council. We have to have the elders and the apostles get together and say, can the, can the Gentiles be a part of the church? Can they have a part of salvation? And the answer is yes. And what we have on the screen here, verses 16 and 17, is a summation of what James says. 
And he says, and this is a quote from Amos chapter 9 from the Old Testament again, showing that this was God's plan. After this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild his ruins, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does these things. It was God's plan from the beginning to include the Gentiles and the Jews together, all of us. And how is this going to happen? How are we going to be able to be unified? Because we have to be the people of God. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and through 29, Paul says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what our skin color is. It doesn't matter what our, 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 our language is, our cultural beliefs are. There has to be a way for all of us, if we are baptized, as we will see here at the end of this verse, this series of verses, if we are going to be that way, we have to be unified. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, that neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to promise, to that promise. And that's the promise for all of us. How do we make this work? It's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult in our own country. We see the trials and tribulations that we've gone through. We fought a war at one point over this very question as to who's going to be considered a part? Who is free? Who is enslaved? How do we treat each other? How are we going to be unified? And that's a question for the church as well. How are we going to make this happen? It's the clear purpose of God that all mankind be a part of the church, but for those who choose to do that, they have to be unified and they have to be one. How do we accomplish that? Well, just as there is a motto or a, a, a statement in our, uh, in our land, e pluribus unum, out of many one, well, we have a form of that in the, uh, in the Bible as well. And that is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And if we turn there, we see that there are seven things that unify us. I'm not going to take the time to read it, but we know this. There is one body. There is one spirit. There is one hope of our calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father above all, who is in all and through all. Those are the things that unify us, but this is really little different than just saying, E pluribus unum. It's easy to say but a little more difficult to put into practice. We call this the unity of the Spirit. We see other passages that talk about this very thing. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says that we need to be speaking the same thing. We need to be of the same mind. We need to be perfectly joined together. How do we do that? Well, the scriptures tell us how to do that, and that's what we're going to be looking at for the remainder of our lesson this morning. Just as in our own nation, making many into one is not an, an easy process and is an ongoing process, so it is in the church. There's always, as I said, people, as, as we see in our nation, people coming and going. Well, we see that in the church as well. We see people being born into the church through baptism. We see older saints passing on to their reward. We see the rest of us in the middle there. And we have to learn to live and be unified one with another. The first passage I want us to look at, and the first point is that it does take a long, a long-term effort, it takes diligence, and it takes a change in your worldview. In 2 Peter chapter 1, and let's let's turn and, and, and look at this passage. We're going to read verses starting in verse 5. And uh, we turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, and not 1 Peter. Chapter 5 of 1 Peter chapter 1 says, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, and knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Think about those things here. These are a stepping stone. When I remember when I was a first a Christian, this was presented to me as a stair step. Each one of these is a step. And yeah, that kind of makes sense, but it 
really doesn't. Yes, a lot of these things build on each other, but they're also things that we can be working on at different times. But I think it's clear that it takes time to develop these things. These are things that we need to add to our faith when we first become a Christian. And these are things that will allow us to be unified one with another because we have to have the knowledge of God. We have to be able to control ourselves we have to persevere, be patient, be to endure, if you will. We have to put on godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly love is what that is, and then love itself. That's how a Christian develops, and this is what each one of us must do. This is something that every individual must do. The things we're talking about today, every individual must be committed to doing so that we all can live in unity. Most importantly, and that's what we're going to be looking at here when we turn to the 12th chapter of Romans, it requires a complete transformation. Each one of us comes from a different background, different beliefs, some from perhaps even a different religion, religious background before we became a Christian. And that was the case with pretty much everybody from the first century. You were a Jew, and we're living were leaving Judaism, you were a Gentile leaving idolatry, everybody really back then was leaving some other religious organization or religious, uh, religious practices and becoming one with themselves and practicing what we see in the New Testament. It was going to be different. And so it required them and all of us to make a complete change or transformation. In Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we look at the change that we have to undergo in 2 Peter chapter 1, what that is, is this complete transformation. And it takes time. It requires us to renew our minds, get our minds out of the world, and get our minds in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. If we do that, we'll be on the road to, to unity. Another thing the people of God have got to do is that we've got to adhere to a single source for living, the gospel. The gospel is what tells us what we need to do, and is the active word that saves us. In Colossians chapter 2 and 3, and we're not going to be reading all of, of, of these chapters, but we're going to look at a couple of verses. But here Paul is telling the Colossian church the things that don't, don't make for you. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he talks about the idea of philosophy or men's thoughts. And a lot of people, there that's, that's really what a lot of people look for. They are looking for wisdom from men, but we're told in verse 8, don't be cheated. It says there, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world and not according to Christ. Paul is saying you can't go to man. You remember when Paul was on Mars Hill in Acts 17, and you had the, the Epicureans and the Stoics. They had all the different philosophies of men thrown in uh, in the mix with the, with the idolatrous religious practices that they were a part of. You remember they said that people would come to that area of Athens, and everybody would go there because they had always had something new. And a lot of people would go and listen because they were interested in listening to what somebody was saying something new. We don't want to do that. Paul is saying here the word of man is not going to save us. It is, it is something different. Don't be cheated, is what he says, because the philosophy of man is a cheat. If you look at verses 11, really, through 23, we then move to religion. Religion other than God's religion. Because it can be a cheat as well. If you look at verse 18, now, of course, in this passage here, Paul's talking really about Judaism. He's talking about the, the practices of the Jews. Which at this time, now that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached, that was no longer God's plan for them. That was, a, that was a plan for the Jews for a certain time period. That time period had ended. Paul is talking to a church full of Gentiles. There were some churches and Jews 
uh, in, in, in the city of Colossae and in that, in that area. But primarily, these are Gentiles. And he's saying that, no, don't be cheated. We see that word again. Verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility, worship of angels, intruding into those things that he has not seen, being vaguely puffed up by his fleshly mind. He's talking about religion, false religion, not just Judaism, but any false religion would fall into this category. Don't let that cheat you. There is one religion and one religion only because there is one God and one God only. Just as there is one church, one baptism, and all the ones that we saw there in Ephesians chapter 4. There is one, and there is one way. And that one way is what we see over in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17, Paul says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So friends and brethren, for the church, for our means of unity, it is the word of God. It is the scripture that has been given, that has been inspired of God. It is it, where to use it for doctrine, that is teaching. It's for reproof, correction, for instruction, and it will make the man and woman God complete. We'll be unified if all of us simply follow God's word. That's what we need to be doing. People of God, that's what we adhere to. A single source for us in terms of teaching us what we need to know to be unified. The next point is that each one of us has to live that gospel. It's the gospel that saves us and the gospel that we need to be looking for, for instructions and for teaching and all that will give us that unity. But if we're truly going to be unified, we've got to do something with that. We can't just read it and walk away, and that's what James talks about in James chapter 1. If you turn over to James chapter 1, James talks about the idea of looking into a mirror, the perfect law of liberty, and then walking away and not remembering, not doing therefore what the word of the Lord says. He says that's not good. We shouldn't be like that. Starting in verse 21, it says, there lay, therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. Some of us might like to do that. Some of us aren't that good looking. He says, I don't want to remember what I look like. But for the Word of God, no, we need to look at it, we need to study it, and then we need to put it into practice. We need to be doers. When we get down to verse 27, we are told that pure religion, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in the trouble, to keep oneself unspotted from the world, to, to basically, our religion is to be right with God, and is to have our love for our fellow being. That's really what that verse is telling us. That's what pure and undefiled religion is. And that religion, right there, is told to us by hitting the pages of the scriptures. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, in this passage, Paul tells us that God created us for a reason. We were created for a reason. And we should think about that. He asked, why, why would God create the heavens and the earth? I mean, that's, the, the scriptures teach that, but it doesn't tell us why. Why did God create the heavens and the earth? Why did God create man? What was the point? Well, verse 10 of chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians tells us, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God wants all of us to be a part of the body of Christ. Now, we know in the scriptures, and we know from just looking at the world, the way it is that there are many people that will choose not to do that. But it is God's will that all of us be a part of Jesus Christ. He wants all of us to be doing these good works. That's why we were created. We were created to do the works that God has wanted us to do. To be the people of God, to be unified in doing those things that are found in His Word. For the people of God, it also requires communication with God. We need to pray to God. In John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23, we have the passage where Jesus is praying 
for unity for his people. I'm not going to turn and read that to, this morning. But that's where Jesus specifically is praying for the unity of his people. Jesus prayed for us. In this case here, it's unity. He prays for us. He prays for the apostles. He prays uh, for us, uh, all, all of mankind throughout his sojourn here on the earth. And he continues to actively work on our behalf now that he's in heaven as our mediator. Uh, standing before God and speaking on our behalf. Prayer for us, though, is the only way that we can commune with God and make known our desires. I've got one other passage down that I'd like us to look at, and that's over in Acts chapter 12. Because if, if anything shows the power of prayer and unity, I think it is this passage here. This is the, the chapter that you see Peter is arrested, uh, and then an angel helps him escape. And after the angel gets him out of jail, he comes to himself, and he's, he, he didn't understand, he didn't know if there was a vision that was happening, if it was a dream. Well, now he's out, and the angel has gone, and now he realizes that, you know, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of jail. And where does he go? Well, he goes to the house of Mary. And it says that, there, that the brethren were at the house of Mary praying. Why did he go there? Why would he go to the house of Mary? He couldn't have known that, of course, they were there praying for him. He couldn't have known that. He just got out of jail. So there's no way he could know that at this point he's not running to anybody else that told him that was going on. He chose to go there. That tells me that even though tonight they were praying for Peter, that this was probably something that happened at her house with the brethren a lot that he would know that it's probably where the brethren were gathered together. That's why he went to tell them he was, had, had escaped. And once he had done that, he then went somewhere else to see some other people. Think about that. Think about us. How often do we pray together? Very few, very, very, very limited time do we ever really pray together. You could say, well, what we did this morning, yeah. yeah. Al led a very good prayer for three or four minutes. And we'll have another prayer at the end, a closing prayer. And we do that every time we gather together. And that's fine. No, no, no complaints. Not, not condemning that. But if you think about it, it's not a lot of time praying together, is it? These folks came and they prayed together. It seems like that's what they were. They gathered to do nothing but pray. Can you imagine how unifying that would be if those, just with those people in that house praying together? I know we can't always pray together, and we pray separately, but it's important for us, for unity, that we pray. It's good for us, but it's good for us as a body as well. People of God also regularly worship. In John chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus says, this is, this is the plan, this is what God wants. But the hour is coming, and now is. Of course, he's talking to the woman at the well in Samaria there. The hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God wants to be worshipped. Is what one of the things this verse tells us. God wants to be worshipped. Well, why do you think that is? Well, we just talked about it. He's the creator. He created everything. He wants us to... To, to, he's got good works for us to do, but he wants some thanks. Because after all, if he had not created us, what would we be? We'd be nothing. Our whole lives, everything depends upon God caring for us, and our means of worship is saying, one means of it is saying thank you. Recognizing who he is, what he has done for us, and by our Offering our worship to him, that is a form of saying thank you. If nothing else, it is saying thank you. In Hebrews chapter 12, and verses and verse 28 specifically, but we're going to look at a couple of passages here, in our verses in chapter 12. In Hebrews 12, we're going to look starting at verse 22. What do we have? Because the writer of Hebrews here is making comparisons between the old law and the new, and he's saying the old law was great, but it's the new law today that applies. And it's greater than the old law. And so he says what the old law was at Mount Sinai, and then in verse 22, but today you have come to Mount Sinai, and to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to a numeral company of angels, 
to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. This is what we have today. These are the great things. This is what we've got. We should worship. Because in verse 28, the writer sums it up here. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace with which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And if you turn the, your copy, it's just a page over to chapter 13 of Hebrews and verse 5. It says there, let your conduct, um, sorry, verse 15. Uh, it says there, therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to him in his name. We should be worshiping God. We should be gathering together and worship. We should be worshiping God individually. You can worship God without it being cor uh, cor what we would call a corporal worship like we are doing today. You can worship God. There are plenty of passages in the Bible that says an individual worshiped God and it was not within means of an assembly like we have today. But we should also be willing to come and worship together as we are this morning. This unifies us. These, all these things make us one. It requires us to have regular association with brethren. We see that in the first, in, in, throughout the, the first century in the book of Acts. The Christians that had left Judaism and then eventually those that left uh, the idolatrous practices of the Gentiles, they gathered together. And there were a number of reasons for that. Some of it was self-preservation because now it was the world against them. But another, the real big reason was we spent time together. If we're going to be unified, we've got to spend time together. Now, when we go back to our, our illustration this morning of our nation, what, what if we all just flew in from what, whatever country we were living in and we just spent a couple of hours here in this country and then we all flew out of here? Would we feel unified? Of course not. We feel unified because we all live here. Because none of us have enough money to be jetting in and out like that every week. We're almost forced to live together because of where we live. We're here within this within this country. We don't have we have an option, I guess, if you will, with the church. We we can choose not to associate with the brethren. That would be a mistake. Because it is with our mutual association, spending time with each other, not just here. In an assembly, but it does happen here in the assembly. But I want us to be thinking outside the assembly. I want us really to be thinking about times when we're not called together to worship. Are we spending time with one another? I'm going to tell you, I don't spend enough time with you all. I'm going to tell you that right now. And I think if we all look within ourselves, that may be something that all of us can say, you know what? We could do better at this. That helps us as a group as a congregation be unified, the spending time with Christians, it helps unity and unification all the time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, Paul says to beware, don't be deceived, evil companions corrupt good morals, evil uh, anything, if you spend a lot of time with it, will corrupt good habits and good thoughts. In Hebrews chapter 10, and here's where we will talk for just a second about the idea of assembling together. There are things that are that that are that we benefit from when we assemble, aside from our worship to God. In verse 23, we are told to hold fast that confession. Well, how how difficult is it when we're in the world to hold fast our confession? But how much easier it is, how much strength we get and encouragement when we are together to be able to hold fast that confession of our hope. When, how, is it, how easy is it for us to, when we are together, to consider one another, to think about each other, and to see what our needs are? We can do that when we're together. Not just together here to worship, but when we're together at other times as well. And then we see in verse 25, the one problem that seemed to be occurring that the writer of Hebrews wanted to correct, and that is, a lot of you are just not assembling together. You shouldn't do that. You should assemble. There are good things that happen when you assemble. And that's how we are unified, by being together. 
And the last point for the ideas of unity is that the people of God have got to be humble. They've got to be gentle. They've got to be patient. They've got to show love. Because without all those things, unity just isn't going to be able to take place. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's the idea of humbleness, let each esteem others better than himself. How difficult is it do you find working with someone that's kind of what we call full of themselves? Difficult, isn't it? They've got the answers, and they do it all their way. But with someone who is like this, in verse 3, who has a lowliness or a humble mind, and says, everybody else is better than me, and if everybody acted that way, how much easier it would be to work together. In Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, the first two verses, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, because not all of us act the way we should, and so we have to make allowances, not excuse sin, that's not what I'm saying, but work with each other, not get offended all the time by each other. But show these characteristics because that allows us to be unified. And then over in Romans chapter 12, some people call this passage the, uh, I think the Beatitudes of a Christian. And that, I guess, makes sense. We're going to look at just a couple of verses here. First of all, in verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. In verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. And then in verses 15 and 16, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, to be of the same mind. Paul says it here again, toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble, and do not be wise in your own opinion. These things, if we put them into practice, will unify ourselves. We will be able to be the people of God, one people. We're going to sum things up and offer our invitation by looking at this last passage in 2 Peter chapter 1. We didn't read verses 10 and 11 earlier. We're going to read it now because we saw verses 5 through 9. We saw the, the, the means of spiritual growth and this means we can take of starting on our journey to be unified with the saints. But here's the result. If we do these things, this is what Peter says. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things... You will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you are not a part of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you have the opportunity to become a part of us, a part of the body of Christ, and to start on your journey of being unified with Jesus and with the brethren. Our end of ancient song. Which, uh, number 268, I believe it is. 269. 269. Nothing but the blood. <clears throat> that unifies us. The blood of Jesus Christ is what unifies us. Being baptized into Jesus Christ is what unifies us. That's what we need to do to be one with God, be one with Jesus, and we then start our journey to be one with the brethren. If you've not done that, the opportunity is set this morning, and there may be those that have started on that journey, but may, may, may be having trouble, may need the prayers of the saints, may need to say to someone, I'm sorry. If you feel that need, the opportunity is, is here for you as well to come forward as we stand and sing this song.